Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Emily Spranger. I'm an academic trainer for the Center for Teaching and Learning. And we're very happy to have one of our own alumni presenting today, Dr. Jason Walker. Um, if you are just joining us, please make sure you are muted and that your videos are off. And as a brief reminder, um, this is going to be recorded and we will post it in our new uh, Space for Housing webinars. Um, all of our webinars are being moved from the Commons to a LibGuides. Um, so please let me know if you do need a copy of it. I'm happy to send it to you. A um, couple of housekeeping things. Uh, Dr. Walker has asked that you can participate in the chat or you can ask questions in the Q&A and uh, we will go ahead and address them as they are appropriate. And I guess without further ado, I'd like to um, turn it over to Dr. Jason Walker for addressing workplace bullying and harassment through trauma-informed practices. Thank you so much. Can you see my screen? Yes. You see the presentation? Absolutely. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, I'm coming to you today from uh, Vancouver Island, uh, Coast Salish territory, and I was talking with Emily, who's in Chicago, and it's like really cold there, and like we have a little bit of snow, and I know I just saw an Edmonton colleague there, and like, it, it's warm today, and, and our snow is melting, and I just needed to throw that out there, um, and, and I noticed the participants are now leaving the presentation, so okay, that's good, that's good. <laughs> So uh, I'm a 2017 grad from uh, North Central University. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself uh, and then jump into to our presentation today. Um, so I, uh, I'm a, 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 a practitioner um, and I, I specialize in trauma and assessment. Um, and um, a, a lot of my work over the last few years since, since North Central, so as an early career PhD, um, I've, been, I've been looking at, at, at research in Indigenous communities in Canada, um, but also uh, my, my passion for uh, understanding the assessment and intervention of workplace bullying. So um, since, since 2017, I've become a mediator and an arbitrator um, and, and um, really focused uh, my time on high conflict, uh, high conflict disputes often in the workplace. Um, I have the, the pleasure of being associate faculty at uh, University of Canada West, uh, Post University in Connecticut, City University of Seattle, yay, uh, and Yorkville uh, University. So I've blended um, my, my work with undergraduate and, and graduate and clinical uh, students. And again, as an early career, uh, three years into a PhD, post PhD, four years, um, I'm really enjoying the journey. So a lot of doors uh, opened for me. Um, prior to that, uh, master's in social work, um, I worked uh, child abuse and sex crimes for quite a few years. Um, and then I don't know if it was more uh, a, a self-punishment or I probably should say a, an exploration of further learning. I, I went on and did a PsyD at California Southern, which just really connected the PhD research piece uh, and the clinical piece that I was really craving. So. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the place where I come from is, is a place of trauma. So um, I, I talk, every, every talk I give, I make sure I, I, I put it out there. I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and I live with post-traumatic stress disorder. And I say that because no matter we're talking about bullying or we're talking about uh, trauma, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, we have to get a little bit more comfortable with the idea that people are walking around us um, with uh, mental health and you can live a healthy, productive, uh, meaningful life. And that's uh, part of what I, what I want to get across today. So thank you, Emily, uh, for bringing me here and I will start jumping into it. Um, the company that, that I launched uh, after my PhD, uh, mastercoach.ca, I'm totally doing a plug for that right now. Um, uh, we do counseling, conflict resolution, a lot of academic coaching, get people through their PhDs. So if you ever want to reach out, please do. And uh, of course, a thank you to the multiple, multiple employers that I'm working with who have made my academic uh, dream come true of teaching. So if you'd like to get a hold of me, 
there's some information uh, with students in class. I'm like, this is the one time I want you to take up your phone and take a picture of that. And it does magical things and, and opens up a, a, a link to me. So I'll have that at the back end as well. And like, just to throw some cards on the table, PhD in psychology, so people think uh, we spend most of our time on personality and, and mental illness, but really I just wanna hammer home the fact I have had more statistic courses than I think is, is reasonable for, for, for any human being. However, very important, and we'll talk about data. So today, um, we're gonna talk about a real problem. And a real problem is the phenomenon of workplace bullying. It is pervasive. Um, and the exposure to bullying uh, in the workplace, we know leads to long-term systemic um, and individual negative impacts to the target of bullying. And I use the word target versus victim because those people are targeted um, and the organization which they work. So multiple studies, including my own uh, research and publications confirm that workplace bullying um, is associated with psychological trauma. And I'm gonna talk about that. Um, and also really negative long-term outcomes for, for people with their physical and their mental health. So we're gonna walk through some of my research. I promise I won't bore you to death with that. And um, I'd like to point out as well, my PhD chair, Dr. Angelica Stones, uh, who is taking me under her wing. Um, she and I have published multiple times since uh, 2017, uh, along with uh, hereditary chief Sandra uh, Harris, of the GITSAM, uh, Jen, Jenny Thomas uh, of Couch and Tribes, and, and Dr. Miranda Phillips, uh, another NCU grad. So let's just jump in. So the question I'm often asked, so what, so what is that, right? Like what is workplace bullying? Well, different ways to start, there's multiple definitions. Each state, each province has their own definition in terms of legal or, or work safe uh, terminology. Um, the leader in the field, NAMI, um, defined workplace bullying um, through the investigation of mistreatment of bank employees a long time ago. Um, so the term workplace bullying uh, has been uh, interpreted in multiple ways, including harassment, uh, emotional abuse, uh, sexual harassment, psychological terror, uh, and victimization. So um, bullying is an offensive, assaultive, harassing behavior. Uh, and the outcomes, again, have very negative effects for people. So we even have a tool that we can use to determine if people have experienced workplace bullying. That's the, the negative acts questionnaire. And it looks at the last six months of your work employment. You answer a bunch of questions. And then we do a bunch of fancy statistics. And here's what we know. In the United States, 20%, 20% of people across all workforces identify through the negative acts questionnaire as having been bullied within the last six months. Now think about that, 20% of everybody. Now, a lot of my work has been around first responders, police, fire, ambulance, the people that we call when we're having a really bad day. Right? When we look at that population, the number increases to 60%. And that's been backed up by multiple studies. So what does that say? For organizations, workplace bullying, lowered productivity, engagement, loss of job satisfaction, increased sick time, absenteeism, a huge legal risk. At the individual level, We'll talk about it more in a bit, but bullying has been attributed to depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder. And get this, in extreme cases, suicide. Let that sink in for a minute. You go to work, you're there to do a job, people target you, bad behavior occurs, and you kill yourself. Yet, Canada, the United States, we still don't deal with it. We are, however, very good at moving the problem. Now, theory, so exciting. 
there. So for a lot of my work, um, I've used Brennerer's ecological systems theory, and I promise I will not bore you with this. What I will say um, is that the ecological model, when you apply it to workplace bullying, makes a lot of sense. Look at the macro system, so the organization, the meso system, the department, and the micro system, the impact on the individual employee. So I'm just framing that because I'm going to show you some data of a study that I've done. So I looked at um, a few years ago, this was for my PhD. And, and from that, I've extrapolated some research and, and, and been quite fortunate to, to publish. So I looked at first responders, national sample, high uh, uh, G and power rating, um, and uh, looked at the, the purpose of the study um, was to look at what is the prevalence and the impact of bullying on first responders, right? First responders, police, fire, ambulance. A couple million of them just in the United States. Full disclosure, I've been a first responder, EMS, law enforcement, still a first responder, critical incident, stress debriefing, that kind of thing. So what occurred to me is that we do a really good job of looking at the Fortune 500s, but we don't do a great job of looking at our frontline workers. So some statistics, looked at demographics, looked at time and job. Were you a supervisor Were you uh, or, or a frontline employee? Really what we found or what I found, what we found, highest percentage, highest percentage of bullying, highest percentage. EMS, emergency medical paramedics. Let that sink in for a second. Second, police officers. Highest rates of bullying. They drilled down a little bit more. This, this is just a slide on frequency of bullying. I'm happy to send it. No presentation in academics is complete without a histogram, okay? So this is just showing the distribution for, for my uh, academic friends in the room. Here's what we found. When you look at anxiety and depression amongst police, fire, ambulance, diagnosable depression, what do you see? Well, law enforcement, the, high, the most significant impact and the highest rate of clinical diagnosis for bullying amongst the first responder population, police officers. Lots of reasons for that. It's a whole different study or a whole different uh, seminar. However, um, the reason I wanted to incorporate that information, number one, it was some really good learning at NCU. And number two, we need to do a significantly better and different job of how we manage, lead, assess, and intervene, especially amongst law enforcement officers when it comes to bullying. So, um, you know, like when we do academic work, what are we trying to do? We're just trying to make a small contribution to the literature, right? So some of the significant things that we noticed in the study, um, increased negative mental health, again, all first responders in this population uh, experience some degree of mental health uh, concern or, or diagnosis around bullying. Yes, we expanded the depth in the current literature, which is important. Um, it, this study followed and supported other studies, similar studies, um, but still what hits home to me uh, is that, you know, the rates of bullying amongst our first responder populations over six times higher than any other. There's, it's, there's enough stress in that organization. Yet you then go to work, I'm not saying everywhere, you then go to work and you get bullied. So there's a significant cop culture shift, e emergency service organization shift that needs to occur very rapidly. This is just my personal favorite slide because whenever I'm anywhere and someone says, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a doctor of psychology. Like, oh my God, are you analyzing me? I'm like, no, that costs a lot of money to do that. Okay, so the impact of bullying one of five workers, approximately, are being bullied at work each week. 50% of people in the workplace are witnessing it. 
50%. 22% of targets, instead of being empowered to take that on, they just leave the organization. Goodbye. Have a nice day. When you look at per year in the United States, it's over 2.5 million people report bullying and harassment. And again, see 20, 25% of people in the last six months. And over almost three quarters of people in their career have been bullied at work. So what does that say? Well, poor organizational leadership is part of it. And data shows that. Poor organizational leadership has been a subject of academic research. And it's well documented in terms of uh, um, the impact or lack thereof leadership takes and how they exhibit often negative personality characteristics when it comes to bullying. Because what do you do? You tell your boss, ah, I don't want to deal with it. No one trained me. So then what do you do? Oh, I got to call HR. Uh-oh. Then what does HR do? Oh, God, another bullying case. How are we going to manage this? Right? Not everybody. But in general. And then what do we do? So I get called into organizations often, again, mediation. Or can you take a look? We have a bullying problem. Okay, sure. Happy to do it. And here's what I usually find. Where is, so, you know, you meet with the target, you meet with the work group, you meet with other people. I'd say eight times out of 10, the alleged bullier is, they have been moved, they've been moved in the organization. Well, they're not in this department anymore. Oh, okay, great. Where are they? Well, they're now the vice president of, or they're the director of, or the executive director of. And it's like, oh my goodness. Okay. So the message we're sending, just basic behavioral psychology, bad behavior at work often gets you a promotion or gets you moved or nothing happens until something bad happens, right? Until someone gets seriously injured or massive social isolation that leads to a negative outcome like suicide. What does it cost us? about $811 million a year, just in the United States, just in the United States. And this slide shows suicide um, and it also incorporates workplace um, uh, mental health, right? Because we do a good job of talking about self-care. We lead in a learning organization or, or or we invest in employee wellness. And I talk to people all the time in my practice and they're like, oh man, I can't take a day off, right? <laughs> we want you to be better and healthy, but you can't take a day off, we need you, right? So we're doing something fundamentally and systematically wrong. Think about this for a moment. The physical impact of stress, the physical impact of stress. So you're sitting at a traffic light, late for a very, so pre-COVID, you're sitting at a traffic light. You're late for an important meeting, watching the minutes tick by, your hypothalamus, which is this tiny control tower in your brain, decides to send out the order, send in the stress hormones, no different than bullying. Your heart races, your breath quickens, and your muscles, they're ready for action. This response was designed to protect us in an emergency by preparing for a quick response. So stress is natural. You stress is good, distress is bad. Same physiological, physical outcomes for workplace bullying, difficulty concentrating, cardiovascular issues, high blood pressure, joint and muscle pain, headaches, get sick a lot, Stomach, that. Uh. Now, notice there's a question, but I just need to pause. I will answer your questions. Mental health implications 
when it comes to workplace bullying, mental health, similar, similar physiological slide, depression, anxiety, sadness, anger, frustration. These are emotional changes that occur. These feelings can sometimes feed on each other and then making those physical symptoms worse. Why? Because someone is behaving poorly in the workplace. We see behavioral changes. For example, you may become withdrawn, indecisive, inflexible. Oh God, I can't make that decision. I'm scared to make that decision. Some people start coping and you know, start smoking again, right? You're gonna start having some alcohol. Greg, I'm gonna clarify your question. 50% of people witness workplace bullying. Thank you, really good question. I will define bullying, I thought I had to find bullying. Every, uh, every, um, uh, just go back a couple slides here. Every state, every province defines bullying differently. We use the negative acts questionnaire typically um, as our uh, standard in terms of the research. And the term workplace bullying has been interpreted, like I said, in, in various ways, harassment, emotional abuse, that sort of thing. Um, but in general, um, it's having been subject to uh, negative, harassing, uh, harmful behavior by a peer or a superior within your organization within a period of six months. Now the range of that, right, varies. Someone said, uh, I never understood the people who witness bullying do nothing. Are they afraid of becoming bullied? Yeah, often, right? Think about, imagine yourself as a rookie police officer for a minute. You are brand new on the job, brand new. And someone senior to you in this special cop culture, there are a lot of good police, don't get me wrong but someone senior to you is acting badly, bad behavior, picking on someone. It's your second week on patrol. You gonna stand up to that sergeant? Of course not, right? The fear of retribution, the fear of retribution is huge. I'm just gonna talk about trauma and then I'll answer some more questions. Awareness is a huge piece of this, yes. And I wanna relate it to trauma. I noticed a colleague of mine is here who is a far superior expert writing a book on trauma. So I will do my best in three slides to uh, um, uh, give you the 25 cent version. A trauma, when the event or a serious event causes a great deal of stress, a lot of stress, all of a sudden traumatic event. Traumatic events are marked by what? Well, violence community violence, sexual violence, physical abuse, natural disaster, bullying. We hear a lot about trauma and the impact on the individual. It's three levels. There's acute trauma. So this is from a single stressful or dangerous event. And unfortunately, thank goodness, a lot of state and provincial workplace uh, work, workers' compensation boards are saying, Okay, well, clearly you can't always point to one overt act of bullying. So now they're finally in the legislation looking at cumulative factors of bullying, cumulative factors of trauma. There's chronic trauma results from repeated and prolonged exposure to highly stressful events. Bullying, domestic violence, child abuse. There's complex trauma. This results from exposure to multiple traumatic events. Think about the paramedic who's gone to like 50 calls, 60 calls, 100 calls, 200 calls. It adds up, right? The reason I bring up trauma in relation to bullying is because one of the most significant mental health outcomes aside from suicide is the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder when it comes to workplace bullying. There's a very high prevalence rate because what happens? Well, think about it. Isolation, shame, 
anger, there's self-verification. Am I that bad? Right? Can I, do I not know how to make a decision? Why is everyone picking on me? No different than the little guy at school. Fear of authority, low self-esteem. Some people get aggressive. So some of the physical symptoms that you will see in someone who is experiencing workplace bullying within the realm of trauma, an extreme Star Wars reflex, right? The little babies, a little baby, you drop something like, ah! Actually, I do that still, but ah! This hypervigilant startle reflex, we get it back. Why? Lizard brain. We'll talk about that in a minute. Behaviors that are uncharacteristic to us. Anger, rage, mood swings. Feeling of numbness. Sitting in the parking lot crying before you go into work. These effects, again, they're cumulative. So our bodies remember trauma and abuse. We remember bullying. And then often when I'm working with clients, what comes up is, God, well, what if I leave? And the next place is just as bad. It's actually drilled into our conscious and subconscious, right? Is this how we're treated? Bullies in the workplace are common to all organizations across cultures and across industries. All research shows that. Whether overt or covert, the actions of a bully are undertaken to intimidate, harass, and affect the well being of that targeted individual. The US Workplace Bullying Survey, think about that. There's a Center for Bullying reported that most targets, 54%, reported that bullying was not just overt and in front of other colleagues, like name calling or derogatory remarks, but also covert, behind closed doors. It can be as subtle as, well, why do you write that instead of the? <laughs> And you have that over, and it doesn't apply to PhD students, but it does apply in the workplace. Those covert methods, never good enough, not good enough. So these findings indicate that some workplace bullying is actually ingrained in the organizational culture to such a degree that it often happens out in the open. It also occurs in private, but in the United States, studies consistently show that the rates of workplace bullying continue to remain stable at 25%. Meaning, whatever we're doing to take it on isn't working. Because what we're doing is intervention, no, no prevention. I want to bring this up too. This slide is really important. So in the psychology, counseling, profession, medicine, what does your doctor always ask you, your physician? Hey, how's you, how's you, how are you sleeping? There's a reason for that. It's one of the key diagnostic criteria for a lot of mental health and physical issues related to things like bullying, right? So whether it be you're experiencing this trauma at work, hey, I'm not sleeping or I'm oversleeping, I'm really tired. I'm always on alert, waiting to see who's gonna stab me in the back. Your resting heart rate, it's like 90 or 100. And we get edgy, right? We're edgy, because we're waiting for it. Just gonna move here, sorry. Okay, everyone, I'd like you to do something for me, because I really wanna hammer this home, okay. Ready? So having a, an extreme startle reflex can result in a range of further withdrawing. And we do that at work when we're being bullied, right? We're not gonna go and sit with our colleagues in the break room. We're gonna go sit in our car at lunch. We react very strongly and wildly to things. And so we often say, oh my gosh, that part, they flip their lid. 
right? I flipped the lid. So how do we flip the lid? So the upstairs brain is responsible for this intricate mental processes like planning, decision-making, self-awareness, empathy, morality. Dan Siegel's work. So here's what I want you to do. If you put your thumb in the middle of the palm of your hand, you curl those fingers around it. And I can't see it, so I'm trusting you're doing it. It's a good handy model of the brain. That's right, I said handy model of the brain. Anyway, that's <laughs> ah, funny. Um, so if you flip up your fingers and you raise your thumb, you'll see the inner workings of the brain stem. Okay? Keeps us alive. Anger, sadness, anxiety, and fear are some of the common emotions a person has as it relates to bullying. Being unable to control emotions can be temporary. It could be caused by something like a drop in blood sugar. But on average, increased stress, increased trauma at the workplace, bullying, it's our lizard brain is working. We are too busy to have executive functioning going on because we're literally worried about keeping our job and staying alive. Fear at work, forget everything and run or face everything and rise, easier said than done. There's three stages of alertness, alarm, resistance, and eventually, for those of you that like to work out, exhaustion, muscle exhaustion, brain exhaustion. So during the reaction, certain hormones like adrenaline and cortisol are released, speed up the heart rate, slow down digestion, shunting blood to the major muscle groups. This happens when we get bullied. It gives us a burst of energy, but only to a certain degree, because here's the window of function. Something happens, right? We're all pretty much in this window most of the time. What happens when we look at this from a trauma-informed practice lens? Getting bullied, the event occurs, get a little spike, a little decrease, another spike, keeps happening. You're going to get stuck on anxiety, panic. Fatigue, restlessness, hypervigilance, emotional flooding. At some point, you get turned or stuck off. Depression, flat affect, cognitive fatigue, pain. All related to what? Bad behavior in the workplace. So what do we do? Prevention, what we should do is start in preschool. But in terms of, I, I give this, I give a similar talk every year. <laughs> I'm surprised they still have me back. It's called Infonex HR. And they asked me to talk about trauma-informed practices and human resources. And so there's a bunch of HR people in the room. I'm like, brace yourself. Imagine a day when an employee is like, oh, what do you got to do today? I got to call HR today. I'm looking forward to it. And the room erupts in laughter because that's who we turn to when there's bad behavior at work. But it is possible. So here's what we have to do. Strengths-based and skill building with all employees. Top down, bottom up. The boss needs to be in the room when we have these conversations. Choice, collaboration, and connection. When bad behavior happens, bullying happens. It needs to be identified, addressed. My personal belief, sometimes it's like, you just need to get rid of that person because they do not follow the values of your organization. Other times though, what if we step back and invested? Coaching, mentoring, what is going on for that person, right? Trauma awareness, just like bullying awareness. Someone in the chat just said that we need to be aware that this is happening. It's costing us millions, billion dollars a year. More than that, people are killing themselves because of the way they're treated at work. That's insane, that's insanity, right? Then there's a degree of safety and trustworthiness 
We need to create safer environments for employees, whether a small company or a large company to say, hey, this isn't right, something wrong here. Now, where do we typically go? Getting a lawyer. Fair enough. Because how else is an employee going to take on a corporation where the boss, not an equal playing field, the power's off, right? But we do need to get to a place where this trauma-informed practice for human resources, for leadership, for management is the norm and not the exception, because right now this is the exception. Someone in the chat said that they were harassed. They worked for a police department. They were harassed, intimidated. In, in uh, Canada, McKay has done a lot of work with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And keep in mind, closed culture, right? Led by police, governed by police. I'm not anti-police by any stretch of the imagination. I appreciate the work they do. The systemic harassment and bullying within the RC Royal Canadian Mounted Police is so significant. They've out, paid out millions and millions of dollars. But in particular, sexually harassed female officers have killed themselves before any of these settlements have happened. And the issues keep popping. Yeah, we'll deal with it. We'll deal with it. We'll do it. But nothing happens, right? Nothing happens. Why? I'm going to rely on my friend Sandra Harris right now. And she would say, Jason, it's in the too hard pile. It's that pile over here. We talk about that. Like, what's too hard to deal? Oh, let's just move them. Oh, let's just make that go away. As opposed to do what's right, not what's easy pile. I have to remind myself of that all the time too. But when we're talking about bullying, talking about harassment, harming other people at work, dangerous. I do have some work, uh, and I can't pronounce your name, I'm sorry, um, but I, I do have some work on the characteristics of bullies. And it comes down to the dark triad. A lot of evidence points to the dark triad. Machiavellianism, psychopathology, and narcissism. When those three things collide, when we do examine bullies, we often see those three dimensions uh, crossing. Um, and I could go into great detail, and I have published some work in terms of emergency service organizations emergency service organizations. And I mean, they're set up as paramilitary organizations, right? Following orders, <laughs> being the rookie. Well, that's what they did to me, whatever. So characteristics of a bully, typically male, typically male. But that has shifted because then we have what's called relational bullying. Relational bullying, typically females. Oh, yeah, look at her. Right, though, well, we're not going to sit with, like, there's that piece as well. Males, it tends to be more physical. Not always. And I think, too, going back, I'm going to, to the, I just, I want to show this slide because this is my, just so we're aware of the complexities of a therapeutic intervention around bullying. It is stages of grief and trauma. And I just wanted to show what we teach in school <laughs> and what happens in real practice. And the reason I wanna show this slide is there is no easy answer. And I think that's part of the problem. There's no uh, silver bullet to solve this problem. But if we steal a little bit of good stuff from medicine, components, counseling and psychology, components of trauma-informed care, they're pretty easy to do. Create a safe environment, build relationships and connectiveness, and we support teaching emotional regulation, emotional intelligence. So these principles for dealing with bullying in the workplace, and they need to be set at the top and filter through the organization, trustworthiness, empowerment, to ensure that the physical and emotional safety of an individual is addressed, is the first important step, and follow through. Oh, I'll talk to them. Not good enough. Not good enough. 
So sometimes we actually do need negative reinforcement in the workplace around bad behavior. Calmness is a superpower, ladies and gentlemen. And when we talk about these harder issues, a lot of us want to avoid, right? Oh God, I got too much, man. This is one more thing on my plate. No, no, we need to stop for a minute. The four R's, right? Realization, recognition, respond, resist. And if we follow that approach and we make it part of our culture where that is not tolerated and the pillars of our work are safety connections and managing emotional impulses, then we would place higher degrees of emotional intelligence and emotional regulation in our hiring processes. Just because someone is good at the task does not make them good at the job. So to the leaders out there, especially those in human resources, you got to take this on, make it a priority. Of course, be objective, be empathetic and be positive, but you need to drill down. There is no one way to do it. And when we talk about leadership and we talk about trauma-informed HR, you can be accessible in different ways, be more efficient. And if you, nothing else related to this whole topic from a leadership perspective, for the love of God, be people over process. Think about that, people over pro, we got policies, we got procedures, right? People first. Right? Can I protect that employee? Lastly, I'm just going to leave us with this. The two, two slides, then I'm done. Um, every presentation, four-step mental health routine, breath work, physical activity, affirmations, journaling. Everyone does better when they do those four things. And lastly, and I'll show, give you my contact information, it is okay not to be okay. Do not be afraid of that. A lot of mental health, it is treatable. So you gotta reach out. Of course, being APA, I insured references. My references, <laughs> and I'm happy to send them, but I'll stop now. Okay. My goodness, this was so great. There, Dr. Walker, there are so many questions in the Q and A. Is it I okay to that. take some of those? Sure, I'd love to. How do you wanna do that? Um, so I'll just run them down for you and then uh, I'll close them out for you as well, too. So okay. uh, the first one in the Q&A that I can see, and I know there was some other stuff in the chat, so we'll see if we can get to that, too. But Greg asks in the Q&A, do you have any statistics or trends you can share about bullying against women? Are there gender differences with, the pre with prevalence? Yeah, excellent question, Greg. I appreciate that. There is. Um, like I said, a few minutes, I realized that question mm -hmm. was earlier. Uh, typically, we see it amongst men in its higher rates because it's usually overt and making fun of you in front of other people. What we often see gender-wise, female-wise, is more relational bullying or aggression, relational aggression, where it's more covert and we're going to socially isolate that person and that sort of thing. So yeah, I could provide that. Okay, great. And then Tanya asks, um, is there any statistics or research on the correlation of bullying victims and acts workplace yeah, violence? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I know my, my dad is in the HR business and, and does some really hard work in terms of when people lose their job. And he was uh, in British Columbia once uh, and I uh, can't remember what town. Someone came back with a, a gun and shot at people, right? So... Um, yes, that happens. No, I don't have statistics on it. That would be very interesting. And, and that would be a great follow up study, actually. Okay, um, thank you. Um, Greg um, asks in the Q&A, can you please clarify the workplace statistics? Are there 50% who witness bullying in the workplace aware at the time or shortly afterwards that they have witnessed bullying or are they unaware? No, so typically what we see for overt bullying is 50% of, oh, that's, how do I explain that? Uh, in general, 50% of employees will be exposed to witnessing bullying in the workplace. 
Um, Stephen asks, um, what percentage of workplace bullying comes from the senior leadership, like CEO, COO, yeah. versus first and second level management and supervisors? Do you have data on that? I have some data on that. I'd be happy to share it. Uh, what I will say at this moment is what we tend to see is peer on peer or supervisor on employee. Typically, the higher level leadership, although of course it's happening, is often insulated from that. So the data that we typically see is related to, to peer on peer or your immediate supervisor. Thank you. Um, let me see, a couple of questions from uh, Kennedy, I believe. Um, forgive me if I mispronounce that. I never understood the people who witness bullying and do nothing. Are they afraid of becoming bullied? They, they agree with bully actions? Maybe they find it funny? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think we could spend three hours just on that topic because, um, I mean, like, truly, that's a really good question. Um, I do not see people who witness bullying weak. I don't see them as, as endorsing necessarily, some. Um, if, if you do not have a safe environment in which you can raise your hand, uh, it, you know, our self defense processes, our self verification, our self efficacy, all that stuff, I am glad that's not me. You know, like it's not do what's right, not what's easy. I'm glad that's not me. And that's typically what we see in the literature. It's not, it's not based on character. It's based on survival. Let me see here. Um, Stephen asks in the Q&A, what, what is the impact workplace bullying has on the unemployment rate? Is there any... Oh, that's interesting. That? Yeah, so typically the EVLN model, it's called. Uh, people will typically e exit. They will exit the organization. Most of us will exit the organization. Thank you very much. Have a good day. I'm out of here. Others will stay, sometimes out of loyalty. Maybe it'll get better. And sometimes it's like, I don't care, man. Like I'm here for the paycheck. I will sabotage everything you're doing, right? And then others, there's no choice. But remember when we talked about trauma, remember we talked about trauma, how are you gonna leave a job and find another job when you are, are depressed, anxious, and, and, and unwell? How are you gonna do that and support your family? Right, good question. Um, I think this is a follow-up from that 50% of people who witness um, that they're aware or they are aware of witnessing it. It yeah. seems that awareness, uh, awareness seems to be the part of the issue. If people aren't aware of it and can yeah. identify it, how do they report it? Yeah, so the, the, I, I, I have shifted my perspective over the last few years and now doing some organizational psychology and consulting and we are aware of this problem. And I'll go back to my friend, hereditary chief, Sandra Harris from Get Sand. And we talk about this hard stuff. She and I were up north and, and were leading a suicide crisis in 2017. And we would talk about well, like, why, why, why is this happening? And she would say, it's the two hard pile guys. You got timelines, deadlines, you got easier stuff to wipe off your desk or deal with an organization. Are you ready to take on a bully? Well, not like most of us, no, not so much until we're forced to do it. So I think I think that's why. So maybe that'll be a study. Maybe NCU will, will uh, fund me for a third doctorate and I'll, I'll study that 100%. I, I, I'll see what I can do. Yeah, you are um, run that. You ladder <laughs> that up. Ladder that up for me. I'd oh appreciate it. Gosh, okay. So Deirdre asks, um, do you think that bullying amongst first responders stem from the whole idea that individuals in the field are to be tough and therefore if they are bullied, it's from showing emotion? Partly. I think a lot of it and what my research shows is that it's that, that emergency services, I was part of it, that emergency services culture where as a rookie, as a new person, we will pick up, we will eat our young, they will eat their young, right? Does it, that'll make you stronger, right? We tear you down and we rebuild. We need to rethink how we do that. I think it's that tearing down and building back out peace. And I think some of it is well-intentioned. Unfortunately, 
we know through research, through statistics, through, it is hurting people and killing people. So we need to shift that perspective. But yeah, I think you're probably right. That's where some of it comes from. Um, some questions. Um, this one, just in the Q&A, you mentioned, you briefly mentioned this in your um, presentation, someone who had worked for the police department and was sexually harassed and intimidated. Right, right, yeah. Um, I noticed that, um, are, I guess later on down in the question, she asked, are you overly concerned? Um, oh, excuse me, hold on one second. Is there an office that you find yourself attached to? Um, she had mentioned that they turned it back on her and it got so bad she ended up quitting yes, the lady. department. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for sharing that and having the courage to get through it. And I think that's a really good example of gaslighting, right? Oh, she's crazy. You can't trust her. You can't trust him. Like, it's them. It's not, you know, come on. You've known me 10 years. This new person, right? I think that has a lot to do with it. Yeah, because we don't want, it's too hard. We don't want to deal with it. Um, let me see. I, I like your, um, just this whole thing that you're saying, the hard stuff and putting that. To oh, the too hard pile. Mine, is, hard mine pile. is high. It's high. <laughs> I like you know, that. No, the cat threw um, up in the garage today. I'm like, I just can't, I can't do it. <laughs> You know, maybe that file. God, yeah, yeah. I'm going to the presentation. Um, let me see here. There's um, Greg brings up an interesting point in the Q&A. He says, where's the line between bullying and managing for high performance? Yeah, that is a great question. And I'm often uh, consulted on that. And I'm sure if there's any lawyers in here, they are too. The employer has the duty and the right to manage people. Right. And we have become accustomed. Oh, you're bullying me. I've been in that situation as a leader. Oh, you're bullying me. It's like, actually, actually, I'm just asking you to do your job. In fact, I'm asking you to do the bare minimum today. Right. So in those situations, it's all about delivery. Right. It's all about relationship and building that respect. And you rely on your policy. You use your support team in terms of HR and you document either side, no matter what side you're on. If you like the bully, the employer, I got to deal with this side or you're the employee and you're getting bullied, you document how you feel, what time something happened, the small stuff, the big stuff. And, and, and often we do see that, right? We got to manage high performers or, or get people to the next level. That is okay. It's the way you do it. You don't walk down to the floor, you single them out, you start yelling at them. You're lazy, you're dumb, you're stupid. Because that happens, right? Yeah. Um, there's a couple of other things. I see just a couple of repeats in the Q&A. So I just, I want to bring this up and I saw this in the chat as well too. Can you share the four R's again? I can share my presentation. I'll share my presentation. You can see it. And I'll Thank put that you. slide in. I, I did that slide Thank off you. the top of my head. Thank you, you so put much. me on the spot and my, <laughs> my hormones and adrenaline are pumping and I'll get it wrong. So. Okay. No worries. Um, so what I'd like to do then, if you mentioned that you can share your PowerPoint, um, he'll send I'll it to I'll add me. that to the, the four hours. <laughs> and he'll yeah. send it to me as a PDF and then I can um, put that 100%. in the LibGuide section. No problem. Um, so just email me if you need um, the presentation and I can get that to you when he gets it to me. Um, couple of other people would like to see your email again, if that's possible. Um, if you take a picture of that uh, screen, uh, but it's Jason Walker PhD at outlook.com. And I, if I can, I see a former student of mine and now Dr. Castata asked an NCU grad as yesterday got his PhD. Do you think that bullying is so common in the workplace because HR is burned out from dealing with a lot of cases? Absolutely. Why are we giving it to HR? Why? Like, seriously, why isn't that the CEO? That should be on the CEO's desk, not the HR's desk. Not, you know, like we should be looking at uh, workplace bullying as serious as a massive uh, bleeding of funds of the organization. And it needs to be top down. It shouldn't be landing on HR. That's what I'm trying to say. Should be landing on the CEO. Good question. And congratulations yesterday. Who is it? Who just got their doctorate yesterday? Yo, Alan Castada graduated PhD from NCU yesterday. Congratulations, Joe Allen. 
<laughs> That's awesome. Um, okay, and I just want to make sure I have this right because I'm going to throw it in the chat for everybody. Jason Walker, PhD at Outlook.com, correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. A um, couple more questions that I think we can get to with the time that we have. Sure. What do you say? H, what do you say to the HR teams that don't think there's a bullying problem because nothing has been reported? <laughs> yeah, I think that they're acting how they were trained. Well, show me the documentation, right? Show me the, again, why are we giving this to HR? This is a mental health, physical health, serious issue with employees, right? We're asking people who've never been trained, uh, many, who's never been trained to conduct an investigation into overt and covert actions and behaviors that can kill people. Here, HR, one more thing for you, right? So, you know, like, come on, of course, <laughs> of course, but, you know, you take the courses, do the work, uh, or call in the third party, but I really believe, like, we should be ingraining this from day one in an organization on how we manage it and, and how we deal with it, and that it's not acceptable. Oh my goodness, um, let me see. Um, do you have any work studies or advice regarding covert bullying amongst one nationality and how managers um, who are not met nationality can even begin yeah. to address. Is there anything you could share with yeah, us? Yeah, diversity, man. Like, number one, wrap your head around it. Because, like, it's 2021. Figure it out if you're a leader. F seriously. And number two, uh, get to know your employees. Why don't you ask them some questions about where they come from, who they are, what, you know, and, and learn the difference. And I have the pleasure of teaching a lot of students from India, and I've spent a lot of time learning the culture. I've had the honor and privilege to work in Indigenous communities for eight years as a non-Indigenous person. I've learned the culture, gone slow, been patient, made mistakes, right? But, you know, I don't treat someone, who, who are you? <laughs> like, again, I know that it might sound harsh or simplistic, but you figure it out, you know, take a course, embrace diversity. And if you can't, it's time for you to retire. <laughs> I love that statement. Um, Tanya asks, in your opinion, what can managers do to recognize or intervene in bullying? Um, learn about it. Like, actually learn about like, what is it? Talk about it with your team. I love five minute stand up meetings, right? In terms of, hey, here's our, reflect on your values of your organization. If you see someone acting outside of those values, you gotta start asking yourself, is this an issue? I need to deal with it, right? So awareness, safe space, get supervision, don't let it go. Wow, wow. bang, 11 a.m. or noon. <laughs> I know, right? It's seriously, you. it's just, there's so many questions still um, in the Q&A. Thank you. So, oh, thank you, everybody. I appreciate um, it. It's a really important topic. Thank you. And I just want to thank you that your presentation has been fantastic. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, I like the aesthetics of your presentation as well, too, not, not just the oh. content. Um, but I want to thank everybody so much for their time today. And again, if you do have follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out as he's provided his contact information. And again, the recording will be posted in our look guide section for the CTL. And if you need anything at all, you can always email, email me as well too. But uh, Dr. Walker, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. That was awesome. Right. Have a good Take day.